The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimpf, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. Are y'all ready? We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day, yet many alumni of color and the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of alums of color. Are y'all ready? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to Aftergate Season 2. It is great to be here. Uh, show 51, for those who might have peeped the post, that meant the last one was number 50. So Aftergate out here hitting milestones and everything. So shout out to all my folk, the listeners, the guests, and of course my co-host, Mr. Herman Dubois. What's going on, my man? What's up, brother? Uh, congratulations on that 50th episode, you know. Uh, it always amazes me when, when we took a moment to reflect when we started this journey without really knowing where it was going to go, how it was going to go. As we often say, we were flying the plane and building it at the same time. And, uh, you know, I've done my share of podcasts and, you know, 50 podcast episodes. Nothing to sneeze at um you know a lot of podcasts don't make it that far so it's been a, an amazing journey and looking forward to another 50 another 50 and then some just to reference that 50 it's uh you know it, it just it just goes to demonstrate that the content and more importantly the the guests we have on our show are are, are by far beyond amazing because every time we have an opportunity to hear another story it never gets old it never it never seems like you know, oh, I've heard this before. Yeah, there's some parallels, but it's amazing to hear the success that folks are having in the world and, and how they process the Colgate experience, you know, um, and I think that that's a testament to uh, the people that we have on the show. And so for those of you who are active listeners, thank you. And those of you who have been guests, double thank you. But we still got so many more folks to interview. So 50, you know, that's cool, but you know, let's talk to me when we get out. On it, you know, we yeah, at that yeah. point, we talking about, you know, who we've had on the show. Um, I mean, you know, the whole reason the idea was inspired was being exposed to some of our alums and some work that they were doing and realizing how uh, little we know about our network. So I'm glad that we've had this opportunity to expose, to learn, and looking forward to doing some more of that tonight with our guest. If it's all right with you, my brother, can I, one, remind people that this is Aftergate, and Aftergate is a weekly podcast where we are trying to amplify the accomplishments of alums of color from Colgate. So it's been fun. Looking forward to doing that tonight. So now, is it all right that I introduce the guest for this week. Please do, my brother. Appreciate that. Always. My man, can we have the uh, authority from our listeners, fans, folk, please, alumni of color, we are honored to have the one, the only, Janine Davison Walker, class of 1986, in the building. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Oh man, we are having, we are just having a blast. Like these conversations. Um, and here's another one: uh, opportunity to learn more about someone who we've been around, we've seen each other, but to uh, say I know your story, I don't know that yet. So I'm looking forward to doing that tonight. Okay. I hope I tell it well. Oh, oh of course, it's your story. It can only be told by you. Uh, so curious, uh, always, I'm always fascinated where we have folks calling in from. Uh, where do you hail from? Well, I hail from the great state of New York, 
Okay. Um, born and raised Jamaica, Queens, Rochdale Village. I'm sure you've What's heard. What's up, Joe? <laughs> Shout out to Rochdale. And um, but I live in Delaware now. I've been living in Delaware for the last 20 years. Oh wow. Okay. Long time. Long time, long time. So different from um, New York. Rochdale, just out of curiosity, because we're all from New York. Are you from the Guy or Brewer side of Rochdale? Or are you on the <laughs> uh, what's the other what side of the Baisley, <laughs> Baisley side Bedell of Rochdale? Side is the other or the side. Bedell Street side. Thank you. But thank I'm you. from the New York Boulevard side. Oh, shout Nobody out to those who even know. Guy or Brewer. I mean, yeah, we know who he is, but we, New York Boulevard. I'm on the New York Boulevard side. Section five, building 19. <laughs> Shout out to Rochdale. So I went to August Martin High School, so very familiar with oh, that community. Okay. Right around the corner now, but to be to take it back to New York Avenue, I went to a church mm -hmm. for Boy Scouts further down New York Avenue at the time. So we either drove down New York quite a bit, or at one point I was taking the Jamaica bus down New York to get to Calvary Baptist Church. Okay. So, um, but okay. Now that we know we all from New York City, let me just, for the record, we weren't on campus at the same time. I always like to give some context to do we know each other? How do we know each other for our listeners? Um, I, I know we've been, because of our years, on campus for reunions at the same time, along with yeah. alumni and color uh, specific engagement. So um, that's how we've crossed paths in the past. What school did you go to? What high school? I went to Christ the King High School. Oh, wow. Okay. In Middle Village, Queens. Yes, yes, yeah. very familiar. Uh, a stone's throw from Grover Cleveland High School. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so my school was in a cemetery. And the reason why, if you know Christ the King, it's like in the cemetery, pretty much. And um, I ended up at Christ the King because to go back some, I went to Christ the King um, Elementary School on Farmers Boulevard. They used to have a church and a school. And then they closed it down and they were closing down parochial schools. So they closed down a black one and they pushed us all to St. Pius in Rosedale. So I we, remember, I know what that is. So we, were, so we went to St. Pius from sixth to the eighth grade. Horrible experience. Horrible, 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 horrible. So, so hold on, because again, we got a lot of connections. So I'm, I was born in Brooklyn, but I grew up from four years old on in Rosedale. So uh, I'm very familiar with Rosedale, the community, the neighborhood. At this time that you're attending that school, it was a very racist community and they did not want black people in any way, shape or form to live there, to go to school with them, to eat around them, to shop around them. That's the Rosedale I remember when you're going to school in, in that community. And so you're right. And that kind of shaped me all the way up to Colgate. So I'll start there. Mm -hmm. So um, we got bused. First day, we're on the bus. And of course, all the white parents and their kids are out and they're throwing rocks at this bus. So I'm what? 12, 13, mm -hmm. having this awesome experience. Great. Um, my sister went to school with me at the same time. We're two years apart. She's two years older. And she's like, come on, get off the bus. I'm like, I'm not getting off the bus. I don't care where the bus goes, but I'm not <laughs> getting off the bus. And so, um, so I don't even remember how that day went, but I did not get off the bus. Um, and, um, and so, you know, slowly, you know, went back to school. I think I fought from the sixth through the eighth grade. I think I fought mm. every day. You know, when you get to the point where your parent, your mother's like, I can't keep taking off of work to come up mm -hmm. here to the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it was one of those kind of experiences. And plus we wore uniforms, right? So we had uniforms from, because I went to parochial school from first grade um, wow. all the way to college. And so, um, so Christ the King didn't have uniforms. So everybody, that was the goal. If you had to go to Catholic school and you had to go to Catholic high school, you want to go to the place where you don't have to wear uniform. Christ the King was it. So off we went. 
<laughs> so, um, so Christ the King was great. Um, you know, it was majority Blacks, uh, Spanish, and Italian. Oh, it was great. We just loved it. Um, I really, I was an okay student. I wasn't in any honor classes. I didn't take any AP classes, but I did well in the classes that I took. Um, very social, um, was a cheerleader for the basketball team. Um, at that time, Wendell Alexis was playing, and I know you remember him. He ended up at Syracuse. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a great experience. And then, um, then I went to Colgate. How so did you I hear about Colgate? Break. Colgate found me. So, you know, remember when we took the SATs and there was that little box that said, do you want schools to reach out to you? I just shaded it in. <laughs> they found me. So, uh -huh. uh, well, actually they found my mother because, you know, you offer a black mother financial aid and she's like, that's the school you're going to. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't my plan. My plan was to go to, to go to SUNY Buffalo because my cousin was going to SUNY Buffalo, but I was supposed to go to SUNY Buffalo and then his sister, who was a year behind me, so we were all supposed to end up at SUNY Buffalo, but that didn't happen. So, um, so Colgate offered my mother this nice little package and my mother said, you'll go into Colgate. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty much how I ended up at Colgate. I didn't go and visit. In fact, I didn't visit any school, actually, because I'm going to SUNY Buffalo. I had no reason to visit school. Um, so, um, so I ended up in a scholars program, went up okay. for the summer. Um, the summer was fine because we were the only ones there. And, um, I had a great time, met some great people. Um, the one thing that sticks out in my mind was we had to do this debate on euthanasia. That's easy. I want everybody to live. <laughs> I lost. They want everybody to die. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember that debate and I lost that because the last thing I said was, would you kill your grandmother? They was like, yeah, kill her. So, kill her. Like, All right, fine. <laughs> Dang. So, um, so I knew debating wasn't my thing because I already lost one debate. My first and only debate, I was done. But, um, but it was great. You know, it wasn't, we were the only ones there. So it was cool. We didn't have any incidences with any of the Hamiltonians. And so um, so it was just such a great, great experience. Um, and then the fall came. And then every situation that I had with white people from grammar school came at me like a flood. So... As soon as I got back on campus, my demeanor changed. I was meaner. And when I say mean, I mean, people tell me, Janine, you were so mean when you were at Colgate. I was like, really? <laughs> that Rochdale Queens came out back up off me. <laughs> and then I was militant. So not only was I mean, I wanted to kill all the white people. I just, I just had a really, really bad chip. And I didn't... Um, and all that emotion was just right there, ready to explode. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I knew I couldn't explode because I couldn't get expelled from college. I just got here. Um, and there was a level of maturity that was expected. And all, all that goes with going to college, you know. And then I had a Black single mother at home who was like, girl, you're going to do this thing. You're going to be the first one to graduate college. You know, all, the, all the added pressure. And so, um, but the one thing that happened that was great was that I ended up in Harlem Renaissance in the fall of 1982. So your freshman year, you end My up in HRC. Yeah, I was in Harlem Renaissance. Okay. Oh, thank God. I have not seen, <laughs> you have not heard. Oh, thank God. So, um, so I ended up in Harlem Renaissance, which was great. I was on the second floor and, um, and I had a white roommate, Mary from... Buffalo, upstate New York somewhere. And she mm -hmm. and I had actually talked. You know how Colgate tells you who your roommate is and they let you kind of talk before you get there. So we did a little bit of that, not much. Um, and so, but by the time I got there, 
you know, it was, it was just, I didn't know it was the first year of HRC. So it just seemed like all the black folks was here and I was, and there was a comfort level that I just needed. Um, and so, um, but I was still, you know, going through my thing because there wasn't many of us there. And so, you know, I still had to integrate mm. with the larger culture at hand. So it was, it was a little bit of a, of a rocky start for me, but HRC was a saving grace for me. Not only did it allow me an opportunity to um, be my authentic self, mm -hmm. um, people accepted me even with that chip. Um, I assume, I guess they just, when they met me, I had a chip. So I guess they just assumed it was a chip. And so they just assumed it was me when it really wasn't. It was kind of like a facade of me that really wasn't me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, but it was this tough exterior that I had developed as a coping mechanism. And that's what I presented everyone at Colgate with. So much to the point that um, Nacio had called me into his office to say that other people don't like me. Now, now, can you imagine? But I got called into to the um, OSU office because people were having a problem with me. But These people know. are other students or yeah, faculty? Other students. Other, black other students. students. Other, oh, okay. Because um, I really didn't, to this day, I can tell you, I can't remember other than my first roommate who I ended up kicking out um, of the room. Um, <laughs> you say that so casually. <laughs> I ended up kicking out. That was me, right? I had a little bit of a chip, but I'll tell you that story because it's hilarious, the story. Um, so where was I? Oh, so, you know, so he was telling me that, you know, there are other Black students who were like, Janine's not friendly, not that I thought that it mattered. I didn't think that it, I, there was a, a, a mandate that all the Black people had to kumbaya. So anyway, so I got I got past that, but um, let me backtrack since I threw the story out there about how I threw. So we were sitting in the room one day. It was a couple of us sitting in the in in my room, and we were talking about um, affirmative action and and how things are going with 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 black people and when are we going to get our due and you know those kind of hard those kind of conversations that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so obviously because I shared a room with her, she came into the room. And um, when she heard what we were talking about, because nobody stopped, mm -hmm. she, she, said, she said, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You Black people, y'all had your chance. It's the Puerto Rican's turn. I said, oh, she was gone. And mm -hmm. so her stuff ended up downstairs, I don't know, maybe a week later. And she had to room with somebody else. So, and that went pretty easily. I mean, nobody said, hey, you can kick somebody out your room. No, no, I mean, nothing from administration. Nothing from administration. You didn't um, have to get their approval to remove this student. She from had to room? go. She had to go. And I was fine with it. And then I moved somebody else in, and then, you know, it's fine. Because she wanted to get out of Stillman. So I said, well, come down to HRC because you're here always anyway. So bang, bang. I got space. <laughs> so um, a lot on, on, on the transition, you know, socially, uh, which is <laughs> sorry. Um, in your freshman year, what, what was the transition like academically? Did you feel that Christ the King really prep you? Or was it a challenge? I mean, you went to the OUS summer. Did that help you? What was the academic adjustment like? Absolutely not. I got no help. I floundered. I mean, if it wasn't for subpar summer where they gave us the extra credits, I'd still be going to death. I mean, <laughs> it, it, was, it was very, very, very difficult um, for me. I mean, the writing, I didn't have to do essays like they asked us to do. Um, 
I went, I, I was fairly good at math in high school until I got to calculus and I realized, no, you're not, really not. Um, so it was, it was those type of uh, challenges I found um, just focusing because I had so many other things that were going on in my mind, just focusing on the work and trying to plan my studies and the appropriate classes and I'm not one to ask for help. So if, if you ask if I went to any of the advisors, the answer would be no. Um, I tried to figure it out pretty much all on my own. Um, but um, I had a couple of upperclassmen who took me under their wing. So that was very, very helpful and beneficial um, that first uh, fall semester. In fact, um, it was... Um, it wasn't Eric, although it was Sandy Hayward and Lorraine Jones. Um, they were class of 84, 84, um, Eric Bowen's class. And, um, and I connected with them. So they kind of smoothed out my edges a little, um, <laughs> kind of uh, uh, like talk me off the ledge a lot, a lot, mm -hmm. because um, even when I felt myself against the wall, my, my tendency would be, oh, I'm gonna have to fight this girl. I'm in college, I can't, that's, that can't be my go-to. Um, so, um, so they really, <laughs> nah, it can't be, it can't be my go-to. Um, but, um, and I can't get kicked out of school. You, you understand there's a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. somebody else at home who I really could not deal with. So, um, so they really, between those two ladies, they really took me under my wing, um, took me under their wing rather, and kind of helped me navigate that first semester, which I found really, really difficult, which I didn't realize would be as difficult as it was. Um, so I really, that first, that first year, I really didn't appreciate Colgate. I appreciated Colgate my sophomore year, junior year, and senior year. So much so that I left Colgate after my fall semester and came mm -hmm. back home and went to Queens College for the spring semester. Um, one, because my support systems, they went to Zambia. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I was the, like, the Zambia study group that we've heard so much about. Yes, so they went to Zambia and now I didn't think that I was able to cope without them. And so I went home and I stayed home that semester when they were in Africa, I was at Queens College taking courses. And then in the, in the um, fall of my, in the beginning of sophomore year, I went back because I had no choice. But that was the deal. You can come home for one semester, but then you had to go back. Um, but when I went back, totally different, calmer, nicer, um, more focused. I just think that first um, being away from home, mm -hmm. being in, you know, the fresh air fund, totally different from what I'm used to. And, and I panicked. And, um, and so I needed, I guess I just needed that time to kind of get my, to regroup and then come back. Because mm -hmm. now I knew what I was what I was going to experience in the fall. I needed to get a plan in the spring, and then come back ready to focus in in my sophomore year, which was perfect. Obviously, administration must have had my name because I never had a roommate. No, she's good. Sophomore did you, junior or senior year, they were like, nope, no roommate for her. Where did you live home. those years? Um, I lived in uh, sophomore year. I lived in Bryant. Okay. And then um, junior and senior year, I lived in down in Cutton. Um, Shepherdson. And then, gosh, where did I live senior year? I can't remember. But Christine Dibble was my next door neighbor. And that's okay. a whole another mm -hmm. bunch of stuff other than that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but yeah, but then. Things started to work out for me. I started to get involved more. Um, I formed a cheer, which doesn't exist today. 
I formed the basketball cheerleaders with, um, I can't even remember what her name was, but we, we traveled with the basketball team, even though they were losers, we traveled with the <laughs> basketball team and it was great. I mean, you know, we had uniforms and all that. We were good. Great. It was wonderful. Um, and, um, and then, you know, getting involved in the cultural center, I didn't, I noticed that most of your guests worked at the cultural center. I did not. I worked in the kitchen in Bryan. I don't know if I'm a mm. person who had to work in the kitchen, but I was in the kitchen. So and I was then, a, I was a saga worker my first semester freshman year. Fortunately, my co-host tapped me on the shoulder and was like, son, yeah, you need to come over here to the cultural center. They got, <laughs> this is what you want to do. Center. I've never worked at the cultural center. Never, never, never worked at the cultural center, but that was okay. Um, and yeah. then, um, you know, so I was involved in, in We Funk and, and okay. DSU. I mean, We Funk was the best. I, I remember vividly the day there was a party in Bryant in the cafeteria, and I actually scratched and mixed a record. Hold up, hold up, wait, wait, you was a DJ? Yes, they taught me how to DJ and do okay. Oh man, please, I got <laughs> skills. I don't know where they are today. Right, right, but, um, right. But back then, uh -huh. I had a little bit of something, something going on. Okay. Um, okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, did you have a DJ name? Oh no, I was supposed to have a DJ name. I well, my nickname was Gigi, but I don't believe Gigi. I used. You know. I don't believe I used a name then. Okay. Okay. Anyway. Okay. But um, but. Through that time, I found a sense of community, which is really what I wanted. Um, and, um, you know, I, my best friends are Koge Grad. Right. I mean, we, we've, we've been friends forever. We travel, we visit, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and so, um, so yeah. And I, and I didn't, and I guess like most people, some people, I didn't really appreciate Koge till after I left. Um, and I look back on the opportunities that the Colgate name gave me, um, the looks that I would get from people when they heard that I was from Colgate, it was like, you're from Colgate? You graduated? Like, <laughs> and then they always have to add graduated as if I went and, and failed out or something like that. <laughs> um, the friends I made. Um, and so it took me a while to... To, to get there um, because, you know, all the racism, all the stuff, all the, the name calling, the, all the stuff that we had to deal with. Um, even some of the, you know, microaggressions by professors mm -hmm. that they tried to slide in it at the time, we didn't know were microaggressions. Um, you know, all those things that after a while you think about, you're like, oh, I'm just so glad I'm out. I'm, I'm just done. And so it took me maybe, hmm, let me see. I left in 86. I went to grad school, graduated in 91. I think by 95, I was selling Colgate at high schools. I had- um, Okay, okay. I had decided to do recruiting yeah. at Colgate. And I don't know how I got in there, but the next thing you know, I was up on campus, they were training me. This big, huge box of Colgate stuff came to my house. Uh -huh. And I was I was off every every career fair. I was pumping Colgate, especially to, you know, black and brown people. Y'all uh -huh. need to go. Y'all need to go. This is a great place. They give you lots of money. You need to go. But, you know, back then, everybody was, I want to go wherever I can go and, you know, pledge and this and that. You can pledge up there. I was like, nah, they don't know. Nah, you can't do nah, that. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. you know, so I did that for about two, two, two and a half years. Where are you living at? What community are you doing this? What high schools are you? Oh, I went back home. So you're back in um, New York doing this. Yes. Okay. I went, of course. I went back home. What do you mean? Where am I gonna go? I went back oh. to New York. Okay, okay. Um, so I was going any they would give you a list. Um of where the open houses were and um, if anything that was in Queens. So I went to the public schools. I went to, I went to Martin. I went back to Christ the King. I went to Grover Cleveland. Um, 
And then they used to have like um, fairs, you know, like in a big building and all the schools would just mm -hmm. be in one place and all the students and parents would come. Um, and I would set up a table and, and talk about all that. So, um, and it was, it was good for the time that, that I, I did it. And then I really, and I appreciated that I kind of like fell away, you know, life got in the way. I started working and doing other things. Um, and then, um, and then I came back, uh, there was an event, oh, it had to be early two, that, maybe 1999, 2000, because I brought my niece with me and we drove up and um, it was an opportunity to talk to the students and I was trying to see if she wanted to go. Um, she was mm -hmm. really into basketball at the time. And um, you know, just to show her around, give her something new and just to interact with the students. Because I think at that time, there was a, a lot of students talking about, oh, well, you know, we like to hear from alumni. The alumni mm -hmm. don't really come back. They're not involved, da, da, da. So I came back and I had this conversation with them and it was cool. And um, and then I didn't come back again for like a long, until we had the 30th anniversary. And then I came back. I brought my husband by that time because I was like, you need to come and see this place that tried to kill me. You have to come see it. And, so, uh, and I said, I said, it's a beautiful place. It's a great looking campus. But oh, because, you know, you tell your, you tell your spouse all this way. You lived it with your spouse. Right. So and um, so when we got up there and you spoke, I think. Hermana, you spoke too in that big room in Olin Hall about where we were, where we oh, came yeah. back to. And when we left, my husband said, my God, y'all been through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you said no, it was one bad. Day you <laughs> <laughs> Because it wasn't just my story, right? So now you have a collective and he's like, uh -huh. my God. They tried to kill y'all up there. And I said it, but through it all, we found community. And I didn't right. realize how much community meant to me until I started looking back on my time in Colgate and realizing I had community. And, and that was really, really big for me. And so um, that was, Colgate is what shaped me. Colgate brought me from jagged edges to a whole woman and allowed me to navigate out in the world amongst varied cultures um, without intimidation, without feeling less than, um, you know, after taking Manny's classes, I knew more about myself than I, than you think, you know, growing up. Right. And so, um, so Colgate, don't go on it. I hate to say it, fellas, but it was a good experience now that I look back. Oh, no, don't be mad. I got two, two questions. One, what was your major? Sociology with a minor in education. Okay. Yeah. Sociology. Because Professor Mungazi was the best. He was the best education teacher I had. And I thought about being a teacher um, because my family, my my grandmother had a school, my, you know, the whole family went through this whole school. Um, and so I thought about being a teacher. Um, and then I said, no. So then I, then I said, no, I don't want to do it. And then, um, but he was such a great, and a, and a mentor and a friend. And even when he moved to, uh, to uh, University of Arizona, we kept in touch. Um, and so he was really a, a really, really good professor for me. And um, and so I think that's why I kept taking the education courses. And by the time I realized that I had already minored it. But sociology was where I was going. My second question is about, you mentioned uh, Manning, Marable. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shared a few episodes back, I had the pleasure of meeting his daughter. And then Minnie was on here. So kind of, uh, she shared. So I'm just curious what, you your memory reflection on uh, that professor when he was on campus? Wow. Um, Manny made 
being black a privilege. And um, from the history that he taught of ourselves, um, from where we came from, from talking about, I mean, that book, what was it? Souls of Black Folks, I think it was like this thick. And, um, you know, having to read that in his book, the knowledge that I gained of myself as a black woman was extraordinary. Um, you know, some days you would, you know, as a kid, you wake up, you're like, man, couldn't I be somewhere else? It's, you know, it's could not be another color or something, you know, this, this is hard, this is hard. And, um, but man, Mary made it, man, it, mm, he was just awesome. And, um, and it was, uh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure being, being one of his students. Um, I learned so much. I mean, Manny was the one that said you couldn't be racist. And um, if you were black, you couldn't be racist. And I've, I've schooled everybody on that as much as I possibly can. And, um, and so, um, yeah, it was, it was, he's a loss to the, to the, to academia for sure. Um, but he definitely changed my life. I was glad I was there at the time to, to partake of his classes. It was, it was awesome. They weren't easy, but they were, they were, they were awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. We're going to stop right there and take a break so that we can show some love to our sponsor. And we'll come back to finish up this conversation with Janine Davidson Walker. So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.homeheroes.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back, welcome back. We are here with part two of our conversation. This is After the Gate season two, and we are here talking with Janine Davidson Walker, but before we get into that conversation, let's make sure we thank our sponsor, Hope Murals. Hopemurals.org is the website if you want to find out more information. Make sure you show them some love because we really do appreciate all that they are doing with Urban Arts, helping our youth with their development. Shout out to Hope Murals. If you are interested in being a sponsor, hit us up at thegatepodcast at gmail.com. Show some love to our network while you're online. Our network is the Defy Life Network at gothefylife.com. You can find some interesting and empowering content on their site. And lastly, check out their podcast hub. That's where they have other podcasts like Aftergate, thefirelifepods.com. Check us out. Now, let's jump into part two of the conversation. Janine, what is the topic that I'd like to bring up to you? Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that the pandemic shine the light on issues and challenges that were already existing. But for whatever reason, the pandemic though, shine the light on quite a few of them. Broadband internet access disparities is an example. Problems in our education system is an example. Health disparities in communities of color is one that it too shine the light on. And as we talk about some of the experiences of the pandemic with the vaccine, and even before the vaccine, I love to hear your thoughts just on some of the disparities that exist in health right now when it comes to people of color. Okay, well, I've been in healthcare for a long time now. And um, the pandemic, and I've always had a, you know, I'm a rah-rah for, for black and brown people. so. Um, when any anything that affects us um, really cuts deep sometimes for me, and the pandemic was one that um, being on the front lines of healthcare, being in a hospital and working in a hospital, um, you know, the ability to see how people's microaggressions against Black and Brown people really put a put a damper on their ability to access good care from not listening to not taking our symptoms seriously um, to even our inability to pay sometimes would cause us you know to shy away from going to get the help that we need it's it's 
it was amazing. And during the um, whole pandemic, when the vaccine came out, and I understand, you know, there was a sister from New York who was the first one, I think, at Northwell Health to get the vaccine. And she did her best to uh, show people of, of color to get the to get the vaccine. There were just so many people who just shied away from that vaccine for, for many reasons. One, they went back to the whole syphilis thing and how we were used, um, like Henrietta Lacks, for for, for um, scientific experiments. And I mm-hmm. feel as if we didn't do a really good job in pushing, b- pushing vaccines to black and brown people in a way that could have been one, easily understood, two, more easily accessible, obviously free, um, and then an opportunity to just to just talk about people's feelings and how they were feeling about it. I had the opportunity to speak to several people who were um, anti-vaccine and um, some of the reasons just really didn't make sense. Um, And and so um, I felt that it was my duty to have to tell people, hey, you know, this is what the vaccine is like. It it doesn't have any any um, 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 derivatives that that will interact with your medication or or something. I mean, I'm sure some people did, and some people obviously could not take the vaccine, but a great majority of us could, and we didn't, and that was to our detriment, and to sometimes to our family's detriment, and that was um, really an opportunity for not only us as healthcare workers to really get out on the front lines. We were out on the front lines and we were doing great work. And um, and we were taking the necessary precautions and the vaccines to make sure that our patients were, 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 um, were getting well. But man, by the time some of our patients came to the hospital, there was nothing we could do for them. And it shouldn't have gotten to that point. And so um, I think knowledge is power. Um, people should talk about what they know. Um, there's a lot of black and brown people in, in healthcare and we should have been on the streets, um, you know, pulling people in and, and telling them this, this is the vaccine, get this vaccine, get this vaccine. I mean, I think I'm up to my fifth shot. Can you get any more? I think I've had a five. Um, and um, it's just, we just have to do better. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about, you know, women in childbirth. Black women are three to four times more, you know, susceptible to dying in childbirth. Why is that? We're in the United States of America. We're not in a third world country. That should not be. Um, and there are just so many, so many disparities that need to be brought to the forefront. We, we bring other things to the forefront. I could care less about Kanye. Bring things that are that are that are relevant and and that help us as a community as a whole. And I and I really and I and I'm really really sensitive when people just don't take care of their health. And there's opportunities out there to do so. Um, I've been fortunate enough to know two um, surgeons in Delaware um, who have actually um, developed their own primary care office just as a as an out, outcome of the whole pandemic and, and being able to reach to reach black and brown people in, in this community here in Delaware so that you know they can get their health care they can they can be um you know transferred to the appropriate specialist um you know but they like to see people that look like them too so so that's always helpful as well so so that's my that's my little soapbox soapbox on that um but um yeah because I love my people and I want my people to live. So that's me. So I just think part of what makes Aftergate so attractive is that we are having the opportunity to talk to this group of people who are not only experts of like really know their stuff, but there's also this passion about making the community better. So I, I appreciate that perspective. I appreciate that take. And um, I, I definitely can relate because I was having some very passionate conversations with some of my siblings and family members at that time and so uh, I definitely appreciate that um I would love to hear now though your journey I'd love to hear when you graduate 
from Colgate. You you mentioned that you went off to grad school, but talk to us about what life like. How do you get from Colgate graduation to who you are right now? Okay, so graduation was great. Um, was it was great? I made it through, um, and then I went home. Um, I started working in healthcare, um, and at that time, you know, AIDS was really really rampant. And I had a job where I had to go to the bedside and get insurance information <laughs> from the patient. And so all the patients, and um, you know, there weren't any um, precautions. We couldn't wear, you know, there was no gloves, no masks, no, none of that. So you just had to talk to the patients as they were. And so, um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I got tired. I know it sounds crazy, but then I got tired. Um, and I said, I don't want to go. I don't want to work. You know, I've got some money in the bank. I think I just want to take some time off. Well, you know, you can't tell a Black mother that. And so, um, you know, it's one of those, you can't live here unless you do something. You got to get a job, whatever, whatever. So I ended up going to grad school. I said, well, if I don't want to work. So let me just go back to school. So that's how I ended up. Um, and I went to Villanova. Um, close enough, yet far enough. And um, I was smart enough to realize that names mean something um, when you get a job. So Villanova was, I was like, okay, Villanova, they got a really name recognition. And so, um, so applied, got in, um, obtained the degree, a master's in human organization science with a concentration in healthcare administration, because that's my passion. And, um, and then I came back started working at Cornell Medical, um, stayed there for 10 years, would have probably been there to this day, um, doing credentialing and privileging. And I don't know if you guys know about credentialing and privileging. Have you ever heard of that? Not at all. Well, there's one of us in every single hospital. Um, I know you heard of Joint Commission and obviously from Eric, you heard of CMS, they, they go hand in hand. Well, Joint Commission, um, requires that before a physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant can put their hands on you, they have to be thoroughly vetted. That's what mine and my team do. So we do all the background checks. We make sure that they're competent, that they don't have any malpractice claims, that they're gone to the school they said they went to. All that is verified through me, that the privileges, if they do open heart, they got to come with me with cases that say I've done open heart somewhere else, either in training or whatever, and I do all of that. So there's a group of us in every single hospital you can't get past. It. So um, people, you know, just can't be a doctor and go to a hospital and say I just want to do this. That's you can't. That's just not how it works. Exactly. No. So that's good. Yeah. That's good to know. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I did not know that. But that is good to know that this yeah, check doesn't happen. They just don't no, show up. And no work. homeboy hookups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I do a lot of background checks. So when people ask me about doctors, I, I can dig where you, where Google obviously can't go. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's what my, uh, that's how I fell into this profession. Cause someone said, Janine, you're never going to make it, um, doing this job, you need to do so much more. And she introduced me to someone in a different department and that became my life. I didn't know that's where it was going to happen, but this is, this is where we are. Um, and so um, I've been doing privileging for the last 20 years. Um, I'm now a director down at the University of Maryland, Upper Chesapeake Health, which is in Bel Air, um, right by Aberdeen Proving Ground, if you're familiar with the area. Um, it's a 90 minute commute for me, that's for sure, one way. So I travel for work. Um, but um, but I but I enjoy it. The people, eh, but the work I love. Um yeah. and uh I think I'll be doing that for a while. Um during the pandemic, my husband and I opened up a virtual bakery. Hey. So we opened up a virtual bakery. Um, my website for everyone is www. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go on, okay. throw it out there. I'm, no, no, throw it out there. Go ahead. www.cruststudio302.com. That's me. Uh -huh. Um, 
So, um, so we're baking up because you know this is this is the height of our season here. We're starting at the height of our season, so we have we have a lot going on. What's but, your specialty? Um, sweet potato pie was the original. We started off making sweet potato pies, and what? And some of our friends said, "You really need to open up a business." Oh, I need to. Okay. Put my order in now. I'm so we ship and we, um, and obviously for our Delawareans, we have local pickup. Okay. Um, and um, so, uh, so we started off with the sweet potato pie and that started going well. And then we added. So now we have lots of, lots of stuff. We've got sweet potato pound cake, regular pound cake, red velvet cake. What's the website again? Uh, like a fusion. <laughs> Give the, give the website out one more time. www.crustudio302.com. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so this is, this is what we've done in our off time. So we, um, we have this, we have this virtual bakery. Um, people can attest. There are people on that have been on your show who have had cake shipped to them, so they can attest. Um, and uh, and so that's that's what we're doing. But um, but yeah, it's it's good. Um, it's it's something new. I didn't think I would be an entrepreneur. That wasn't anything I saw myself doing. But my husband is a huge entrepreneur fan, and you know, if he could work for himself, he would. Um, and, um, and so here we are. And just like I that. I have to ask, how did, how, how did the baking thing take off? I mean, was she the culinary person? You the culinary person? Was it one day you had the munchies and said, let's see what we can bake it. I'll shower Leon. Like it's not, um, it's not every day people just launch a virtual baking company. We started off, both of us were making sweet potato pies and we were giving them away. We were just giving them away. Um, and, um, for the holidays, you know, Hey, here's a pie, here's a pie. You get a pie. You get a pie. You get a pie. And, um, and so, uh, and both of us bake. My husband is a great baker as well. Um, and so, um, you know, he's, we, I woke up one morning, it was in June, June of 2020. And I said, what are you doing? He said, we got an LLC. I said, oh, we do. And you know what we do. I'm in business now. <laughs> it's been good. I mean, it's obviously it's new. I mean, we haven't been in business that long, but it, it has been a learning experience and it ha and it's fun. Um, when yeah. you think back to what it was like when you're going into college, if you had the opportunity to give some words to the young lady who was entering Colgate, what would those words of wisdom be? And then also, the Janine that's graduated, if you had an opportunity to tap her on the shoulder and whisper in her ear, what would you say to those? Um, to my younger self, I would say, don't let the bad experiences define you. Mm. Um, you'll make great friends. You're a good person. Do the work. Life will life will benefit you. It'll you'll be beneficial in life. Um, and as a graduate, I should have taken a year off and traveled the world. <laughs> mm. um, you won't get a chance to do that as much when you get married. Although Dubai was nice. Um, Think really hard about what you want to do and don't be afraid to pivot in your career. What's up? And the church, eh? I think I would have pivot and done something else, but I thought, you know, this is where I should stay. But I, I probably should have pivot years ago. But here we are. But well, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. So I'm going to give you the official opportunity to promote any endeavor, website, opportunity that you would like to get out to the universe to get our 
for our listeners, supporters to take advantage of? Is it one, two, three things, whatever you like, here's your opportunity, here's your platform. Well, obviously I'm gonna promote Crust Studio, www.cruststudio302.com. That's the first thing. Please guys support us, we love you. We'll be around for a long time, so don't feel like, you know, but if you wanna call tonight, please do. Um, and also, the pandemic is still here, people. Wear your mask, be safe, be careful. Between RSV, take care of your kids. Between the flu, take care of yourself and your kids. And COVID, if you can, get your shots. If you can, keep on your mask. Take care of yourself. That's what's up. That's what's up. Um, any last words before we get out of here? No, this was fun. This has been another episode of Aftergate Season 2. Thank you to our guests. Thanks to our listeners. As always, Aftergate is powered by the Defy Life Network. This has been an, another amazing podcast, so we appreciate it. You know you can check us out on all of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Many more dope episodes to follow. Remember, the Colgate of your day is not the Colgate of today, and it's not the Colgate of the future. Peace, family. You hear that? Listen closely. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters? Smaters? The peanut gallery? Who's that? When you're in your zone, all that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, Spit that verse or close that deal. The only voice that matters is yours. Defy life.